All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for our Understanding Holocaust History Lecture on the Ellen Loeb Katz Collection. My name is Annie Black. I'm the Director of Programs and Volunteers at the Museum, uh, and we're happy to, to virtually see you today. I'd like to first thank Spencer Cronin, our co-host for today, our program coordinator, who is always operating these behind the scenes for us. Uh, you don't see him, but he's making everything run smoothly. Thank you, Spencer. Uh, and before we get started, just a couple of logistical announcements. So we will have plenty of time at the end of the program for question and answer. If you'll go ahead and locate your Q&A button for me, if you're on a computer, it's probably going to be in your bottom bar there, the little Q&A button. If you're on a tablet, it might be at the top. But anytime you have a question, it can be during the program or when we start Q&A, you can go ahead and type your question there and we'll get to those at the end. Uh, in addition to Felicia Williamson, who's our Director of Li Library and Archives, who will be presenting today, Dr. Sarah Abosh Jacobson, our Chief Education Officer, will join us for Q&A as well. Uh, and this is actually the, the last of the lectures that we have in this Understanding Holocaust History series we've been doing over the past couple of months, but not to worry. We have some great new series that were uh, starting in June, which is Monday, I guess. So um, I do encourage you to go check out our website, dhhrm.org, for all of our upcoming programs and events so you all can keep engaging with us. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Felicia Williamson. Well, hello, everybody. I'm so glad to um, be speaking with you today about one of the most impactful collections in the museum's archives, the Ellen Loeb Katz Collection. Um, just as a brief mention, this collection does feature in the core exhibition, so we look forward to you coming to visit the museum and, and spotting it on a panel um, talking about Anne Frank and Ellen Loeb Katz as an example of someone who had a similar story to Anne Frank, but who survived the camps. So um, let me share my screen with you so you can see my presentation and then we'll go along. And then as Annie mentioned at the end, we'll take some questions. So please, please jot those down and we'll, we'll have some time to talk after the presentation. Oh, um, it looks like it won't let me share the screen. Just give us one second, Felicia, we'll take care of that for you. Okie dokie, here we go. So as a brief overview, so you can know a little more about what to expect, we're gonna learn about Ellen Loeb Katz and her family. We're gonna look at the document trail that came to us in her artifact collection. We have about a little less than 100 um, photographs, letters, telegrams, um, and objects that came to us at the museum in the early 2000s. And we're gonna talk about some highlights from that collection. Um, through that, we're gonna learn about four camps um, we're very fortunate in that Ellen Loeb Katz recorded her memories and experiences in a memoir immediately after being liberated in 1945. So we'll learn about these camps through her own words. And then I've added some additional context from other resources. So we're going to learn about Westerbork, Theresienstadt or Theresien, um, Auschwitz, and then Linzing, which is a subcamp of Mauthausen. So Mauthausen in Austria is the, is the administrative unit and Linsing was the camp that Ellen was in. Um, and then specifically, we'll learn a lot through Ellen's words and the documents about medical care in the camp system, which may seem like um, a, a conundrum because why provide extensive medical care if the goal is to exterminate? But we'll talk about it. We'll, we'll learn about it from Ellen, who was a nurse in all four camps. Okay, so here's a brief overview of Ellen's life. She was born in 1921 in Germany. Um, the daughter, the second daughter of Dr. Julius and Dinah Lowe. Um, Julius was a physician and Dinah actually worked as a dietitian and that will become important in their time in the camps. Um, just one second, okay. Um, the family, worked hard to flee Nazi aggression and like so many um, fled to the west into Holland hoping that would keep them safe. Of course in the end we know it didn't as the Nazi Reich and Empire extended all the way to the west and to the east and, and impacted them again but in 1936 they fled. Um, during Kristallnacht Ellen's father suffered a stroke 
um, and ended up dying later in Vester Bork. Um, Ellen and her mother survived four camps by the end of it. Um, Vester Bork, Theresienstadt, Auschwitz, and Linsing. Um, just for a moment, I want to say sometimes it's surprising to learn that um, survivors and, of course, victims were in so many camps, but that was fairly common that you wouldn't just get deported to one camp and stay there for the duration. That did happen sometimes, but many, many, many survivors were shifted to the west and to the east following the front lines and the increasing um, pressure on the Nazis. And so um, Dinah and her mother started out in the West in Westerbork and in Holland, went to the East, to the Czech Republic, to Theresienstadt, further East into Auschwitz, were there a very brief time before the front started moving westward. And there was an increased attention to using female laborers. And so they were sent to a labor camp that was a sub camp, Mauthausen in Western Austria. So really covering a, a huge portion of Europe and their deportations. Um, they were liberated by troops actually from the Dallas area in 1945 um, and were able to immigrate to Dallas in 1946. Ellen went to work right away as a nurse and, and ended up graduating from UT Southwestern and she became a hematologist who worked to cure cancer. Um, so pretty incredible story. So we'll, we'll get into it. I want to take a moment to talk about the timeline because it becomes confusing um, very quickly to see how and when um, Ellen and her mother were moving through these camps. And so just briefly, in 1936, the family leaves Germany, goes to Holland. 1942, in November, the family, so Helen's mother and father, Dinah, and Dr. Julius Loeb, and then Ellen, who also went by Ilsa and Illa, um, were deported to Vesterbork. Um, it's pretty early days to be deported. Um, and many, many, many um, Jews who were deported to Vesterbork went directly to Auschwitz and, and to their death. So they ended up being in Vesterbork for a year and a half, um, which is significant. In March of 1944, Dinah and Ellen, their father had already passed away, um, were deported to Theresien or Theresienstadt. Um, that's significant because most, a huge majority of those deported out of Vesterbork went to, directly to Auschwitz. Um, Ellen and her mother were deported to Theresien or Theresienstadt and were there for six months before eventually being deported to Auschwitz. Now, they were only in Auschwitz for a little, or just around a month, which is also significant. The survival rate of Auschwitz is very low. Um, and then they're deported further back west to Malthausen, which is a, a, the administrative unit supervising the subcamp of Linsing, which is a female labor camp. Um, they were liberated from Linsing slash Malthausen in May of 1945, so they're there about a six month period. And then their immigration was heavily facilitated by having um, a direct relative here in Dallas. Um, Ellen's older sister, uh, Gertrude Chacno had arrived in Dallas in 1939 and was able to real, really help them immigrate. Um, again, Ellen graduated from UT Southwestern as a physician in 1952 and died in 1980. So again, as a summary, they were in Westerbork for a year and a half, in Theresienstadt for about six months, Auschwitz for about a month, and then in Linsing, Mauthausen for six months before being liberated. Um, and so I wanna take a moment to talk about the hospital in Vesterbork. A big reason that Dr. Julius Loeb was able to survive for about six months in Vesterbork and that both Dinah and Ellen survived Vesterbork is because they were quickly absorbed into the internal infrastructure of Vesterbork and became part of what made that camp run. And the way that worked is Dinah worked as a dietitian in the hospital. Ellen worked as a nurse, and Dr. Julius Loeb was very ill already and mostly unable, unable to work, but he made a showing as a physician, and, and, and basically Dinah and Ellen really protected him quite a bit within the hospital system. And Vestibor Hospital was a large concern. It was, in comparison to other camps, a camp that had a fairly robust infrastructure 
in place, including the hospital with a lot more equipment and oversight at the beginning of the war. That decreases towards the end of the war. Um, but this is this immediately creates a, a huge pressure on anyone working in the hospital. So this would include Ellen and Dinah. And I wanted to bring in a quote from a research article. And I'm going to read this for you. Regardless of what happened to individuals, the quota of eastward bound train passengers remained the same. Hence, it was a zero sum gain, a temporary gain in vain. Doctors would say one person slated for deportation only to see someone else's name appear on the list. Rather than focusing on healing, physicians and managers found themselves prioritizing some patients at the expense of others, trying to juggle the influx against the output of bodies for transport and numbing themselves to the ultimate consequence of their action. Um, Ellen speaks about this poignantly in her memoir saying, you know, I, I just couldn't get my mind away from the fact that we were saving these people just so they could be well enough to be deported to Auschwitz and, and that we in the camp knew what that meant, which was almost certainly death. Um, again, about Vestervor, it was an excellent hospital with a capacity of 1,700 beds. It had 120 surgeons, more than 1,000 employees, was equipped with an operating theater, et cetera. Um, inmates were x-rayed for tuberculosis, immunized against typhoid. And again, this is, this is highlighting a camp in the West where they're putting a, 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 some effort into keeping people alive. But the reason they're keeping people alive is that they're able to, to be deported to Auschwitz where the Nazi uh, hierarchy can kill more people with less uh, attention. So these people are being saved just so they can be murdered. So I wanna take a, a few minutes to really dive into the document collection. The Ellen Lovecats collection um, came to the museum in the early 2000s. It was donated by Ellen's sister. The Holocaust Museum, the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum also has Ellen's uniform and it's currently on display and that uniform was donated by Ellen's husband. So just a moment to talk about Dr. Julius Loeb. Um, he was a medic in World War I, and after surviving that experience, he, was a, he taught volunteer, volunteers how to administer first aid in case of disaster. Um, so I really think of him as having been an upstander and a, a, you know, a, a contributing member of, Dal of uh, I'm sorry, of German society, and I think it was very painful to have to leave and be rejected from German society and from his profession as the increasing pressure on Jews and, and Nazi German um, increased more and more, that included losing the ability to um, practice his profession. This is a letter in German from a physician in the Netherlands about Dr. Julius Loeb's health, basically advising that he doesn't think it's wise to deport him to Vesterbork, that he would be unable to survive the process. Basically a plea to not deport the family. Um, they, were, they were able to avoid deportation for a while, but eventually they, they were deported to Vesterbork. So it worked for a time, but not for very long. Um, and, and to this letter's point, he did not survive the experience of going to Vesterbork. He died some months into their time there. Uh, there's, there's dozens of letters and postcards. Most of them are between the Loeb family and friends outside of Vesterbort, um, pleading for help, um, either help for um, immigration paperwork or for money or food. So this is one example, a postcard from Dinah Loeb to Lisa Pincus um, from May of 1943. She mentions she has a bone infection, that they need clothing. She is also making the recipient of this letter aware that Gertrude Schack knows mother-in-law had died. And, and it comes out in the memoir that she died by suicide shortly after arriving in Vesterbork. Um, and so that is Ellen's sister's mother-in-law. Um, and and, and it's interesting to see that they're talking about how precarious all of their health is. So um, Dinah Loeb has a bone infection. Um, of course, we know that Dr. Julius Loeb has had a stroke and is very ill. And of course, we find out that this 
family member committed suicide. And we find out also that that um, Ellen was sick off and on. So really, they were in constant danger of being deported because their health was so um, precarious, but also dying in the camps, which of course the father does die in the camp. Um, here's a postcard from Dinah Lug to Richard Strauss as a friend in, in Amsterdam. Um, the Strausses are the most common uh, correspondent we have in the collection that we received. So there could be other correspondence that just wasn't saved, but this we do have. There's, there's dozens of letters back and forth. Um, really, the crux is it, the Strauss family was doing everything they could to support the Loeb family inside the camp. Um, sending goods, food, letters, communications, and significantly doing a lot of work to try to communicate with um, Trudy Shackno here in Dallas, which wasn't always successful. Um, this is very important because they would receive a package here or there from the Strausses, but those extra calories and the, the goods they received allowed them to barter and trade for necessary things inside the camp and also just increase the number of calories that the family was able to consume, which made them less likely uh, to be selected for deportation and more likely to survive day in and day out. So um, that's why I think, you know, that the, the um, Strauss family is really a, a, an example of an upstander. They were working as hard as they could with the resources available to them to support this family inside the camp. This letter I pulled out as an interesting example of, of, you know, in our day and age, we have a ton of opportunities to communicate instantly. Um, you know, those of us who look to the past know that this is a new invention and that um, used to be you would have a huge lag time between hearing from your family members if you were able to hear from them at all. Um, and, and certainly wartime that was worsened by um, uh, the scrutiny that each letter went through and the, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm failing to get the word for um, when the government would check all the letters, I'm sorry. Um, but, and then also just, you know, ships were not making it across the Atlantic. Uh, there's huge hurdles to communicating with family members. And here we see um, that Gertrude Shackno here in Dallas was notified that her father died in November of 1943. Um, and then it's stamped in October of 1944. So almost a year later. So this, this letter certifying that Gertrude Shackno's father had died in Vesterwort takes almost a full year to, to be sent out of Europe. And that's just a small little example of the huge um, obstacles to communication. Um, so uh, I thought that was pretty interesting. And we also know that a lot of the letters that got sent or requested to be sent on behalf of the Loeb family were never sent or never received due to wartime restrictions. Here's a letter from Dinah and Ellen Loeb to Richard Strauss, again, dated 1944, February, I'm sorry, dated February 28th, 1944. And this is significant because they have been notified that they are finally being deported out of Vesterbork. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, most people deported from Vesterbork went directly to Auschwitz and the majority of those people deported from Vesterbork to Auschwitz were murdered in Auschwitz um, and did not survive. The Loeb's, Dinah and Ellen, were number among the lucky um, uh, prisoners in Vesterbork because they, they first of all, were in Vesterbork for a year and a half as part of the infrastructure that kept the, run, the camp running. Second of all, they were an, an, on the far minority in that they were deported to Theresienstadt. So here we, we see that they've been notified they're going to Theresienstadt and they're begging um, the Strausses to please be in touch with their daughter in America, uh, Trudy Shackman. This is a nurse identification card for Ellen um, and when she's made it all the way to Mauthausen in 1944. I just thought it was interesting. It's written in, in handwriting. It's an ID card. That, that word in German, Krankenschwester, means nurse. Um, and so I thought it was pretty interesting. <laughs> 
it does have a different birth date than um, some other evidence I found, which is a little bit confusing. But um, so, just as, as a one of the last documents to talk about um, before we get into the really paramount document, uh, the memoir that that Ellen wrote. This is a letter from Gertrude Shackno to Dr. Ellen Loeb Katz and Diana Loeb, and it's dated June 27, 1945. And here. The family has been reunited across the Atlantic. Um, Gertrude has found out her mother and sister survived, her father did not, and is trying to help them navigate a really tough journey to get to her in Dallas, advising them to um, seek the help of the Joint Distribution Committee to get some help from a lawyer. Um, she's trying to send them money, and they were the lucky ones. They had a family member in the United States that was ready and able to try to help them through the, the uh, difficult process of immigration, even after having survived all these camps. And then finally, we're gonna spend really the bulk of our time taking a deep dive into Ellen's memoir. Um, immediately after being liberated, so she was liberated on May 5th of 1945 from Mauthausen. She goes on this really amazing journey to get out of the former German Reich and back home. We'll talk about that a little later when we talk about liberation. Um, but almost immediately, she sits down in June of 1945 and types out a, it's about 15 page single spaced uh, memoir where she records the best of her ability, her experiences. Um, and I can't overemphasize how rare this is, how significant this is. First of all, very few memoirs were written in the immediate post-war period. Um, so that in and of itself makes this rare, but what makes it very rare is that a minority, a, a strong minority of those memoirs written in the immediate post-war period were by women. Um, there's, a, there's a website called WorldCat. Um, it's a catalog or attempts to be a catalog of everything published in the world. Um, so World Catalog, worldcat.org. If you haven't spent time on that website and you're a nerd, I really encourage it. It's a good way to spend an afternoon. Um, and just spending a few minutes toying around with it, I found about 73 memoirs that were, that were published by Holocaust survivors in the immediate post-war period from 1945 to 1950, and 13 of those 73 were by women. Um, so significantly, WorldCat will catalog objects that are not published, so manuscripts that are in archival collections, so some of those memoirs have never been published. Um, including this memoir. Um, and so I'm going to, uh, just to take a moment, I want to say that there was a book written about nurses in the camps. It's called Sisters in Sorrow. Um, many of the documents in this collection that we're discussing today, including the memoir, are translated in that book chapter about Ellen's story as a nurse in the camps. So it is available through that mean, means. So at this point, I'm going to spend a few minutes really reflecting on the experiences of Ellen in each of the, these camps through her own words. Um, as a museum, we think it's incredibly important to let survivors speak for themselves, um, if, if at all possible, to allow the art archives and artifacts to tell the story and to not get in the way of that. And in that spirit, I'm gonna read some of Ellen's own words about her experiences in each of these camps. Um, in reading her memoir, I was uh, struck by the things that she got caught on when she was reflecting, and really a lot of the things that she really struggled with and was talking about repetitively and seemed to be very um, heartbroken about was her wor work as a nurse and how futile it was and how hard it was and how little comfort, in her opinion, she was able to provide people when that was her main aim. Um, and so uh, that's kind of the preview. So here she is talking about Vesterborg. We lived there in the barracks with 300 people. Mother and I were next to each other on the third floor. Mother started working in the kitchen. She worked as a dietitian. Father worked just enough to keep him off the transport list. And I was lucky, I worked as a nurse. Poor father was alone all day. During this time, we were on the list to be transported to Auschwitz seven times. You cannot imagine how upsetting this was. Um, this is something she mentions in relation to each camp, which is how they were alerted to or warned of 
or even told that they were going to be deported. Um, often this would happen in waves and, and, and you would know it was coming and a lot of people would be deported and you'd be notified, but they were able to negotiate themselves off the transport list, as she says, seven times. But this constant fear of not knowing what was coming next, of not knowing what it would mean, um, is something that comes up again, in her, uh, again and again in her memoir. On the days there were transports, we had to get up at 4 a.m., dress all the sick people and ready them for the trains. It was more than a person could do to put these people in those cattle cars. It was awful. I can only say that we did not know where they were going. We thought they were going to Theresienstadt, which was not thought to be all that bad because the Red Cross made periodic visits there. If anyone would have known they were where they were really being sent, nobody would have had any hope and they would not have survived. Um, she talks about hope as a method of survival at several times in her memoir. Um, and as, as I feel like hopefully a lot of us know, Trazenstraat was held, as, held out as this model camp and it was in people inside Vesterwork were even aware of, well, if you make it to Trazenstraat, you might have a chance. Whereas if you end up going further east to somewhere like Auschwitz, your, your chance of survival is very low. Um, in Vesterbork, before, before Ellen was deported to Vesterbork, she had been trained as a nurse, but had never practiced as a nurse. Um, and, and so here she's reflecting, that's when I started to be a nurse. I knew absolutely nothing, but I acted as if I knew everything. I just watched everybody wherever I could, and pretty soon I advanced to being a friend of the head nurse. After observing her for a short time, I learned how to take care of my patients. One day I heard that there would be 20 very sick children from another camp arriving in Holland. We were to make them well so they could either go to work or at least be brought into Auschwitz to be done, a week, done away with. Um, and she actually spends quite a lot of time talking specifically about the efforts they went to to save these children um, and the fact that they, they, it was very clear to them that they would be going to Auschwitz and that they were saving these children to be deported and that she had a, a, a sincere struggle within herself, whether what she was doing was making their lives worse or better. Um, but the other side of the coin was if she didn't cooperate, she certainly would have been sent to Auschwitz. Um, and so she takes some time in her memoir to really struggle with all of that um, conflict, internal conflict she has. So one of the most significant parts about this memoir is that Ellen takes the time to describe each transport, um, so deportation train that each uh, that she and her mother are put on, um, and it shows a, 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 a the difference between where you are deported to and the kind of transportation you were taking that you were taking. Um, so it's good evidence. So here she's talking about being transported to Theresienstadt which again, that happened in March of 1944. Mother and I were put on a transport list again, but through her work as a trained dietitian, we were rescheduled for a later date. The same worked for me. We were actually among the last thousand investor work. So those of you who joined me for my talk on the Reese family collection, they too were numbered among the very last prisoners to be deported out of investor work. Um, and certainly that was helpful if you're hoping to survive, to be able to stay in a camp in, in Holland for as long as possible. Um, the transport to, to Trazenstadt was not so bad, two days and two nights in a normal train compartment with whatever belongings we had left. So again, sometimes when we're thinking about deportation, we think about iconic cattle cars with 100 people crammed in one car. That certainly did happen. Um, and Ellen and Dinah ended up on a car like that later. We'll, we'll read about it. But their transport from Vesterport to Theresienstadt, they were on a regular um, um, train. So they had their belongings, they sat in a seat, and she reflects that it wasn't that bad. Um, here's a few mentions of life in Theresienstadt. In 1943, the circumstances had been terrible in Theresienstadt. Hunger was especially bad in 1942 and 1943. The hygienic facilities were impossible. People died hundreds at a time in one day. In 1944, suddenly everything started to get better. There were fewer people there. We were expecting the Red Cross to come to Theresienstadt, so everything looked great. Excuse me. 
we got a little rest here and there and had the feeling that for the foreseeable future, there would be no transports. This made a great difference. So historically, we know that um, as part of a propaganda campaign and in, in response to increasing international pressure, um, the, the, the Nazis arranged for a Red Cross visit to quote unquote their model camp at Theresienstadt. They gave the camp a facelift. Significantly, they deported thousands of prisoners to be murdered in Auschwitz to make it look roomy and less crowded. Um, and this is around the time that Dinah and Ellen arrive in the camp. So, um, you know, things in the camp had some stability for a little while, and that quickly changes. Here, Ellen is describing being deported to Auschwitz. So she and her mother were in, <clears throat> excuse me, so sorry. I'm just gonna double check my numbers. They were in Theresienstadt for about six months and then were deported to Auschwitz, um, which I, I think we can assume she would have thought of as a death sentence. And here she's describing in her own words. In September 1944, the transport started again. The transport was terrible. We traveled in wagons, seven, 70 people with whatever they had in one compartment. We sat on top of and underneath each other. The trip took three nights and two days. Nobody knew where we were going, but the more we traveled, I'm sorry, I just. Nobody knew where we were going, but the more we traveled, the more we knew that our destination was to be. In the end, we came to Auschwitz. It was called a Vernichtungslager, which means killing ground. Um, and I inserted extermination or death camp. There, I could not work as a nurse. So people know what Auschwitz means. They even knew enough to know that if they were in a train going east for a certain number of days, then it almost certainly meant that's where they were headed or a camp that was similar to it. Um, here's some reflections on life in Auschwitz. They were in Auschwitz for around a month. Um, and, and so enough time to really get a sense of the camp, but not so much time that they died there. Um, they sent us to a shower room where they took all of our clothes. All of our hair everywhere was shorn off. We were given one pair of pants and one dress of rags. We had to stand in line for hours. Then we were put into a barrack. We had no dishes, forks, or spoons. Six of us ate out of one pot with our hands. There was no place to wash, no soap, and no toilet. If you lost weight, you went to the gas chamber. You could not get sick because if you did, you would be killed. Of the 2,000 people who came with us, there were only 15 left. So you can see the the conditions are extreme um, and the chance of survival is very low. Um, at this point, they were deported to Malthausen and then a subcamp of Malthausen called Lensing. And this is significant because as the war effort in the Nazi um, in the German Reich was um, going on and on and things were more dire, they started um, reemphasizing the use of women in work camps and labor. Um, especially in the war industry. So in late 1944, they established a new subcamp of Mauthausen, and then the transport out of Auschwitz that Ellen and her mother Dinah were on was the transport of women that would work in this camp, in this subcamp of Lensing. Lensing was, um, well, we'll get into it in a minute. I have some more details about Lensing. It was pretty interesting. Um, and so here she describes the deportation from Auschwitz to Lensing. We traveled for three days and two nights without anything to drink. We could not get out. There was no more food, no light, and no windows. Seventy people were standing up. You cannot imagine what the conditions were. People would vomit right onto the floor between us and on us. We just were not human anymore. The air was impossible to describe. We were totally kaput when we eventually came to Lensing. This is a place not far from Linz, Austria. So I want to take this opportunity to talk about Lensing as a camp I didn't know anything about until digging into and trying to understand the context of um, Ellen's memoir and her um, experiences. Um, Lensing, uh, again, a subcamp of Mauthausen. It was populated by women all from this one transport um, in November of 1944 from Auschwitz. Um, the women worked to manufacture artificial wool for the war effort. Um, in her memoir, there's some really excruciating details about the kinds of um, 
illnesses and wounds that resulted from this work to, to manufacture artificial wool. Um, the company is still in existence and mentions the use of um, quote unquote prison labor during the war. Um, what it doesn't mention is that they were using very toxic chemicals to try to turn wood pulp into some sort of wool that could be used for uniforms and other uses in the war effort. Um, and the women working in this camp would sometimes get chemical burns um, and inhalation burns that were so severe they would die the same day. Um, and so Ellen worked as a, a nurse in this camp and saw this firsthand. Um, so here's a, a lot of historical detail about that transport carrying 400 to 500 um, prisoners to Lensing to work in the um, viscous production or um, artificial wool production. Um, I want to take a moment um, in her own words for Ellen to tell us about the realities of the hospital block where she worked in Lensing. The worst thing was that only a certain percent of my patients could be sick. Of the 560, um, that's inmates in Lensing where Ellen worked as a nurse, I had 120 ill. Only 40 were allowed, so there's a quota. The others had to go to Mauthausen and that meant gas. So I had to declare them fit to work if they were able to work and that was one of the worst things. The women who were sick were too weak to send to a factory, but everyone knew that if they had, that they had to go if they wanted to live. A German doctor came to see that nobody pretended to be sick. Uh, she, she goes on at some length describing this song and dance that the people working in the hospital had to go through. So they had, of course, it's a concentration camp, it's a labor camp um, with really gruesome conditions and the women are engaged in very dangerous factory work. But if you were determined to be too sick or too weak to work, then um, if there were over, over 40 out of the, say, 600 people, in the camp that were ill, then the, the Nazis would come knocking. So they had to send people to the factory who were too ill or maybe even unable to walk. And if they didn't go, um, then they would be sent to the gas. And so she's trying to navigate all of this. And there was Nazi oversight. So a German doctor would come through and, and kind of check off a box. And if he thought someone was pretending to be sick, um, who could work, then, then the people in the hospital, um, the prisoner workers and nurses would, would get in trouble, or if there were too many sick people, then they would get in trouble. So it's a pretty complicated um, scenario. Um, I, I wanted to give a moment to her descriptions of medical care in the camps. Um, here she says, there was no rest. They were coming all day with all kinds of complaints. We did not have a thermometer. We didn't have a real watch to count it, well, the pulse. So we had to estimate. Um, so there, you know, we're talking 1940s medicine, so there's limitations in and of itself, but they don't even have the most basic of equipment or treatment options. Um, I never really thought of how fortunate it is that I have a thermometer that I can tell fairly quickly if my daughters are getting sick because their temperature starts creeping up. Well, you might have a uh, hundred people in the hospital wing and you have no idea how sick each person is and making all the decisions you have to make about their care uh, becomes more difficult. Here she says, we had some aspirin and gave it all kinds of medical names so that they thought it was some sort of miracle medicine. So they had a very limited amount of medicine. Um, it had limited efficacy for the kinds of illnesses they were seeing. Um, and then a lot of it comes down to in her reflections giving the prisoners enough hope to make it another day. Um, next, she says, if there was a big wound, they often got wounded diphtheria, an infection. But the Germans were so afraid that they would get diphtheria that they gave us some serum and it healed quickly. So just showing that the Nazis were fairly aware of what was going on. They actually had some resources they could have given the prisoners and they decided to or not, depending on their own um, factors. Um, Ellen very poignantly describes someone who we would call an upstander who helped her and her mother during their time in Lensing. I want to give some time to this because at this point she's been in um, four camps of the course of three years and really to my mind there's two groups or individuals that helped save her and her mother. The first is the Strauss family back when they're in Vesterbork and here 
is this man, and we don't have his name, unfortunately, who was interceding on her behalf over and over again. So I wanted to share with you what she shares about him. The only light in this terrible time was one man who, at Christmas time, brought us a little piece of cake. This is a great, great favor. Out of all those horrible people, there was one person who had that one bit of compassion. If the SS had caught him, he would have been gassed. Afterwards, a couple of times, he brought us a slice of bread and even a cup of coffee. And later on, he did even more for us. He came over at night and told us what he heard on the radio. That helped give us hope. He really knew where the Americans were. In fact, he told us to hide in his house when it became necessary to flee the barracks. Um, you know, when we think about information and controlling information, it was hard to get accurate, ac accurate information inside the German Reich, even if you weren't in a camp. If you're in the camp, it was incredibly difficult to know what was going on. And of course, if you had a concept that you're on the verge of liberation, that hope was so important and he gave that to them. There's a couple of little quotes I wanted to share with you that I found meaningful. Um, you know, Ellen's reflections in her memoir are, are fairly descriptive, but they're not overly emotional and they're um, matter of fact in some ways. Um, two things she said though I wanted to pull out. Sometimes you don't know how you get through these things. And then she said, how all those people got well without medicine or diet, I can't understand. I think it was their will to live. And so she mentions in lots of different ways in her reflections of each of these camps that having the will to live, having hope somehow from some source was instrumental, even if it was the hope of an aspirin pill curing tuberculosis, which of course she knew didn't make any sense. Um, but it, it seemed to help. So um, I'm going to talk about liberation. Um, and here in Ellen's words, now came the big no moment. We were freed. The plan had been to shoot us or gas us all. But I heard that the manager of the factory took his car and met the American army and told them of the women in his factory. This influenced the high command to get to us two days earlier than had been planned. On Friday, the 5th of May, at 6 p.m., we heard the alarm. After silence of five minutes, we knew we were free. The SS ran away, and on Saturday, we were given over to the Americans. You cannot imagine what that meant. Most of us were at the end of our strength. A few more days, and we would not have made it. Um, again, she says, the Americans' first concern was for sick people. They brought us food for these poor sick patients. After four days, we were all put into a real hospital. We had 30 beds, linens for everybody, pajamas, water, medicine, anything we needed. It was a dream. How quickly these Americans took over. Everybody got an x-ray. Unfortunately, the results were very bad. Most of the patients had active tuberculosis. Uh, so in contrast to these three years she worked as a nurse, all of a sudden she has a huge amount of resources at her disposal. And you know the bad news is now she knows what's wrong with many of the patients. And it's a very serious disease that it took many people who survived the Holocaust five plus years to fully recover from. Um, there are a few photos I found of liberation of Lensing available at the United States Holocaust Moral Museum. And I spent some time just on the wild hope I would be able to spot Ellen or her mother in these photographs, and I couldn't. Um, but this is um, an American sergeant, and here he is in front of some liberated female um, survivors in Lensing. A pretty amazing, amazing photograph. There's five or ten photographs they have there at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, finally, uh, I wanted to give you an idea of how much work it took to finally get home and eventually to immigrate. So this is a transport card um, for Ellen. And to get home, she and Dinah went through, looks like seven places and eventually made it back to Amsterdam. Um, and then again, their friends and family there helped um, keep them safe. They ended up staying with the Strausses again. Um, so they continued to be looked after by their family friends in Amsterdam. Um, and eventually they did make it to the United States in 1946. This is a deregistration document um, saying that they are preparing to immigrate to Dallas in 1946. Um, and then just quickly, I wanna leave some time for some, some questions, but the amazing, 
survival story is that Ellen writes to her sister in uh, Dallas, Texas and says, you know, I know it's crazy. Uh, I just got out of a concentration camp, but I've been working as a doctor inside these camps and I want to be a doctor. And her sister in what feels like a very American response says, sure, come to Dallas. You can do that here. No problem. Um, and so she does. Um, and here, Trudy, in an oral history interview in our collection says, well, eventually my sister was a laboratory assistant. She had been a young girl when I left. I was 23, she was 17. Her schooling had not been finished in Germany, but she was able to get into a school for laboratory assistants. So when she came back to Holland and after experiences in the, in the concentration camp where she was a nurse, she made up her mind she was going to be a physician and she got herself into medical school. Then they came in 46 to New Orleans with all the other cotton boats and from there to Dallas. And so in our museum, you can see there's a panel um, talking about Ellen's journey. And in the end, she ended up be, becoming a physician. She graduated from UT Southwestern in 1952. She became a hematologist um, and ended up working uh, to develop a method to preserve bone marrow to help cure leukemia which is just an amazing story. Um, there's a brief mention of her working one of the hospitals in the camps on, on blood work and on testing, um, but I couldn't find out more about it. But it's pretty interesting that she, I think in my mind, was learning and preparing for her career even in the midst of the chaos of the Holocaust. So here's a photograph um, in her doctori doctoral robes in her regalia. This is an image of her graduation program from 1952. Um, and this was 10 years in to the history of um, UT Southwestern. Um, and then just amazing, she was honored with an Americanism medal from the National Society of the da Daughters of the American Revolution in 1968. I thought that was pretty incredible. Um, here's an article about her and her philosophy of work and inspiration from her experience in the camps. Um, I, I want to, I'm going to skip right over this. This is some background on Trudy and her journey. Essentially in 1932, she, she immigrates to um, Holland and then um, gets married and then is able to escape to the United States in 1939. Um, and the, the big takeaway is she spent the entire war trying to, to help her family and really spent good chunks of time not hearing anything about them and didn't know what had happened to them after, until after the war. Uh, I wanted to read one quote from her, her, her oral history interview, um, which is significant to me as an archivist. Um, she writes, uh, or she says in her interview, I found a diary and lots of documents from the concentration camps, an almost day by day diary in my mother's safe after she died. She never talked about anything. When my sister and her came over, they decided this is it. They must have known. We will not burden the young children. They gave me a diary to read and then they put it away. So she's saying, and this is a story that we hear again and again from survivors' families, where the survivors really close the door on the past and try to move into the future, build a life here in the United States, and leave their um, traumatic experiences behind. Um, but in this case, they stash the, the memoir, so that day by day diary is the memoir, um, um, Ellen's memoir. And they stashed this correspondence in a safe. And then only after both Ellen and Dinah die does Trudy discover it and realize um, that they've recorded their history in this meaningful way. And then she thought had the foresight to donate it to the museum, which led us to discover it and to make it available through um, lectures like this, putting it on display, using it to teach student groups. And I think it's an amazing legacy. And, and to that point, I think this collection, I, I strongly believe the artifacts are evidence. Um, and this, this collection of just under 100 documents, it tells us more about the camps that Dinah and Ellen were in, tells us a lot more about the transport experience or deportation experience. We learn a lot about medical care in the camps. And then we learn a lot about the psychological and physical trauma that these individuals experience. And so it helps broaden understanding and deepen our understanding of something that is in a lot of ways um, just impossible to understand. 
Um, just a, a brief mention of some of the resources I use. Again, that, that book, Sisters in Sorrow, has the documents in our collections, many of them in translation. Um, most of the documents are in Dutch and German. Um, and then there's some articles that I found useful about Vesterbork and Lensing. Okay, let's, let's have some questions. So the question, there's a question in the Q&A. Feel free to type your questions there. Um, was the Strauss family related to the Loeb family and where were they located? The Strauss family was not related to the Loeb family. They were family friends and they were in Amsterdam. Um, you know, there's a question about the man who was an upstander and, and brought them cake and so on inside. Um, Lensing, and I don't know any more about him. I don't know his name. I don't know how he got access to the prisoners. I have no idea. I wish we knew more about him. Um, and then repost the resources page, certainly. Let me do that. Let's see here. Okay, can you guys see that? Um, so Ellen passed away in 1980. There's a question about survivors of Ellen in the Dallas area. Ellen passed away in 1980. Her husband died in 1988. Um, and then, um, then uh, her sister died in the 2000s. So I don't believe so. Ellen, and then there's a mention, um, so Ellen, you know, she was about 60 when she died, and this memoir really was covering the time in her camps. It focused in, entirely on that period of time between 1942 and 1945 when she was in the camps. Alicia, I noticed that um, there's an obituary for her husband, Mort Katz. Yes, and, and not for her. That he had a son, but it doesn't say uh -huh. that they had a child. Yes, uh, I spent a lot of time investigating that last night, and I could not get anywhere. So, so there so, is a Jacob Diamond Katz, which was his name, the son's name, who's 37 years old. Um, he was born uh, uh, and lives in, in uh, Cleburne, Texas. So well, he may or may not be a relative. Well, yeah. so, so she died in 80. If he's 37, then he was born in 82. Right. So he's possibly the child of Mort, but not her child. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, let me tell you, folks, um, as, as a historian, um, Sarah will vouch for this. And as an archivist, I will just plea, um, take the time to do an obituary. There's more and more people we cannot find obituaries for, and there's such a rich re resource um, to understand more about people. And and it, yeah, Sarah's right. I spent a long time looking for an obituary for Ellen and didn't find one, which is a real pity. And there could be one, and it's just not available digitally. I would say because she died in '80, she yeah. predates a right. lot of the digitization yeah. of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to second what you're saying, which is that obituaries um, in in everything from local newspapers to, to things like the Times of London are, are what they are is mini biographies of people when they're done right. right. And they are a spectacular source of historical information. Yeah, they're very Absolutely. good. So. Absolutely. Um, and we do not have an obituary in the collection. Um, that would have been valued if we had. Um, there's a question, how did Ellen and her mother avoid being transported from Best of Work several times? Was it due to their skill? That's a great question. And, and she goes at length. Frankly, it's very hard to follow, but she describes many of the near misses and being put on the transport list. But they did things like she would take, and we have records from other survivors about this, she would take um, something to speed up her heart rate. So that would make the Germans afraid she was ill and wouldn't, would make everyone on the transport ill, and so they wouldn't deport her. Um, another time, um, she mentions that they were being selected to go to, um, to be directly sent to a gas chamber inside Auschwitz, um, and they survived just 
barely because um, the SS doctor looked at her mother's legs and said, oh, you know, you have edema, essentially a swelling, which means that you're nearing death. Anyway, you're going to go to the gas chamber. And so the, her mother says, oh, no, this is hereditary. Look, my daughter has um, swollen legs as well. So some part of it was luck, I think, certainly. And some part of it was their ability to use their knowledge of, of medical issues to, to negotiate their way off of, of being deported or transported or in this in that case being gassed. Um, so pretty tricky stuff. Um, I, I, I think that's all I, I can say about that. But there's she does describe it in some detail in her memoir, each kind of near miss. Um, okay, I think we're about done. I'm so um, grateful to you all for joining us. Um, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you further into summer with our new programs.